Lord. Tonight we're going to be looking at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I know we've been taking quite our time in the book of James, but I really do believe that James is a very important book to our spiritual growth. Uh, it helps us to mature in the Lord, and especially if we have a desire to reach that next dimension. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of people talk about levels, but I believe that God doesn't just want to give you to a level, He wants to get you to a dimension. And the, the deeper the dimensions that He gets us into, then we'll see, you know, a powerful move of Him. I believe that there are people, in, even in our church, that are of the children of Eskar. You know, the children of Eskar were the ones that people of Israel had to come and see, and they could see into the future. They were seers. And so, uh, I believe that God wants people that can proceed and see things, you know, ahead of time. But before we can get that, there are certain things that we have to get over our flesh. The flesh. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at the source of a troubled church. The source of a troubled church. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 12 says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your, your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and Convict and cannot attain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterous and adulterous. Do you not know that friendship with the world is intimate with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw not near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your late laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother judges his brother. Speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? We find that there is no denying that James' instruction in chapter 4 is needed for our churches today. All too often we can point to a local congregation that is in chaos because of one or two people who are self-serving. Okay, self-serving. Their lack of spiritual wisdom can certainly be disheartened and disappointing. Not to speak of their unkind judging, undermining the health and vision of what God has in mind for them and the church. It is here that James exposes the source of all churches' uh, conflicts. Our carnal nature, our carnal nature gets in the way. Uh, it promotes itself, uh, you know, no matter the cost, even if it means all out war. You know, we want to promote ourselves, and by even promoting our family members, we want to promote ourselves. So, we find that teaching on this subject certainly cannot be overlooked. It's very important to each and every one of us. The harm done to the church is too large to avoid. And so we look here that James you know, jumps right into the source of the trouble. What is the source of the trouble? And we're going to be looking at verse 1, and then we're going to skip down to verse 11 and 12, and you'll see why I you know, kind of 
put these scriptures together. We find that disorder within the church usually spawns from envy and selfish ambition. Okay, it always starts with envy. Somebody, you know, thinks that they're better than somebody else and they have ambition. So James, you know, puts it bluntly, it leads to take no prisoners. Take no prisoners. I'll take anybody out that I have to take out. Okay? Um, so, uh, fighting, it just comes to fighting. The Greek meaning for war, and he used war, refers to the real brutal armed conflicts among nations. The brutal conflicts. Now notice what he's saying there. It's brutal. Uh, back in those days, and even in ours, even though we have um, weapons of mass destruction, but they used to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, they would get into battles, and of course, they'd be cutting off uh, limbs and everything else, and blood would be everywhere. And that's what he's saying. It's like a slashing, gashing type of you know war. It's a brutal thing. The Greek meaning for fighting here literally means to battle without material weapons or battle without material weapons, kind that leads to heated, angry disputes. He, heated, angry disputes. We get the English word quarrels from this. We quarrel from this. Um, it means to set another at each other's throat. Okay? Not necessarily touching somebody, but you ever get into an argument that you get so mad that you, you know, you can literally strangle somebody. And this is what the scripture, you know, this word means. You know, you want to strangle. And so, this person uses their tongue as a weapon. They use their tongue in, in a hit and run tactic. You know, they'll say something and then they'll back off. You know, some you know people will say something and they'll go, what, what did I say? I didn't, you know, you just took it wrong. Well, it was a hit and run tactic. You know, they knew what they were doing. They just backed off. You know, and you are the you, you are the problem. And so this you know this person uses his tongue as a weapon. They use it intensely in a better way. Okay, uh, they clash in a fierce way. Such quarrels in the church are not by God's design. We find in uh, Philippians 1 and 27 that Paul writes, and he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am a base, or absent, I'm sorry, I may hear of your affairs that you stand in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So notice this, we can't stand together in one mind if we're fighting against each other. It's like Amos says, how can two agree, you know, walk if they don't agree together? You know, there's going to be a fight. And I want to, I put the special note in here, I want you to understand, is that James is not speaking about disagreements. Okay, he's not talking about um, disagreements that are expected from time to time. Everybody will have a disagreement. Husbands and wives will have a disagreement. Children will have a disagreement. Uh, boss and employment, employees will have a disagreement. And so the same with churches. Anytime you have people, you're going to have different viewpoints. Okay? Nevertheless, we all learn to disagree without being disagreeable. That's the key there. You can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, unfortunately, many have grown up in families with unhealthy relationships. And that's what we need to understand. When people come into the church, they are coming from broken homes. And so they have they don't know how to communicate with each other. We even have that in Christian homes. You know, people can't communicate properly. They lack the skills to learn how to disagree and still accept another viewpoint. Conflicts are usually a sign that someone has lost their focus and has shifted uh, to pity issues. To pity issues. You know, the fights are never normally about, you know, what's important. It's always the pity little things. Uh, you want to see a church fight happen? Bring in a new doctrine. 
And I'm not talking to bring in a doctrine that is against the Word of God, but something that they've been taught for so many years, and you bring something that's a little bit deeper, and they don't understand it, and so they get into a fight over it. Okay? They're little pity little things. Uh, when a person has shifted the focus on their own selfish desires, that's another one, their own selfish desires, what they expect and what they want. And one of the things that I have found in a church that fights a lot about is money. Is money. And I want to bring this out because it's very important. Uh, when it comes to tithing, you know, a lot of people say, well, I pay my tithes, I expect this. Well, you need to understand when you pay your tithes, it's not yours anymore. It belongs to the Lord. Actually, all of it belongs to the Lord, but it really belongs to the Lord. And so what, where the money goes, it's totally between those that are in charge and God. Okay? And so we need to understand that release is God. You have no power. This is not a democracy. Okay, this is a theocracy. God is in control. Okay, and so we need to understand that. Uh, so, selfish desires. You can uh, rest assured war will be declared, and we find in 1 Corinthians 1, 12, and 13, I'm just going to talk about this, is that Paul will say that some say they're of Apollos, some say that they're of Peter, and some say that they're of him. And he just asks the simple question, did Christ, did any of, did Apollos die for you? Were you baptized in Peter? You know, and so the thing is, is that we have these little pity little things that go on. It first begins by standing off to decide, talking, taking pot shots at those who we disagree with. You know, we take little pot shots at them. We try to find somebody that will be on our side. We're looking for people to be on our side. We take pot shots. And, you know, or somebody is being used in the capacity that we want to ourselves. A lot of times, you know, uh, if there's a Sunday school teacher that wants a certain Sunday school classroom, and so they'll begin to take pot shots. Well, uh, this teacher is not really studying. They're not really reaching out. I heard that the kids don't really like them. And, you know, what the real reason is is that they want the class themselves. It's not trying to help somebody. It's trying to bring them down. So James warns us, if you are doing this, you are standing on dangerous ground and interfering with God's business, okay? That's what he's talking about, the judging. You are interfering with God's business, okay? And so he asks in Romans 4 and 4, 14 and verse 4, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Okay, so we need to understand that it's God that does the judging. So, a person that has a problem with this, uh, is, it's not hard to identify who is at the heart of the conflict. Because four things will surface in their own spiritual condition. Number one, their fellowship with God is in jeopardy. You begin to see how they you know, respond to the move of God. Uh, all of a sudden, at one time, they may be sitting at the front of the church and they begin to move back. Uh, you begin to see their, um, their missing services. Their prayer life is blackened. You know, they're not coming to church, you know, before service to pray. You know, they make up excuses. You know, so it becomes in jeopardy. Everything comes into jeopardy. Okay. They have uncovered their own pride and insecurity. And anytime they start talking about things, their their pride and their insecurity. Nobody appreciates me. You know, we use this word. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody loves me in that church. Okay? You know, we use all these kind of things. Or, you know, I love, always love this. You know, I, I go to church, but there's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, you better not go to Walmart either, because there's a bunch of hypocrites there too. You know, those cashiers, those greeters, they really don't care if you're there or not. Okay? So, they show their insecurity and their pride. They have set themselves up to be judged by God. Okay? That's the thing. God begins to judge them. That's what we call a conviction. You know, conviction is going to come in. And, they, and he heavily begins to judge them. 
they have broken the harmony of the church. And that's the key. They begin to break the harmony. And if there's anything that God despises is somebody trying to break harmony. That's what the devil did. That's what Satan did when he was in heaven. He broke harmony. Okay. Selfish ambition is a serious offense and leads to greater trouble to those who harbor such feeling. So where is the source of all this? You know, where's the source? Some people make mistakes and say that, well, it's outside influence, it's the devil, and all that. But the source knows where it is. It's pleasure. Pleasure is the source. It gives us the idea of sinful desires, sinful desires, the ultimate gratification of natural desires, the gratification of natural desire. It is the pinnacle of lust, the pinnacle of lust. The Greeks describe this word for physical pleasure, with physical pleasure in all aspects. We get our English word of hedonism, hedonism, okay? And hedonism is um, unrestrained desire to fill every pleasure available to the senses and avoid pain. So anything that gives you pleasure is okay. In other words, uh, the 60s use this word, if it feels good, do it. You know, because that's what that's your your ultimate goal. That's what you have the right to do. Okay? Animals have this. If it feels good, do it. Type of thing. Uh, the New Testament always uses this word in the sinful sense. It means satisfying the uncontrollable pleasure of the natural man. So we find that this is where the source is. And the wrong concept, again, is many people think that strife among believers begins with external situations. External situations, this is not true. Conflicts come from an entirely different source, and it's pleasure. Okay, likened to life, pleasure likened to life. Everything is based on me getting as much as I can and how much fulfills me. Okay, that comes into everything. And you know, I know something, this is the problem with marriages too. It's a problem with marriages. If you have this type of attitude, you know, it's all about me. I got to get as much as I can for me, you know. This is my money. I'm going to buy what I want. You know, instead of working together for one goal, we work for opposite goals, um, then you're going to have trouble. Okay? Again, uh, Jesus talks about the, the seed that fall up among the thorns, and those are that are among the thorns go after pleasure, the pleasures of life, and they bring no fruit of maturity. Seeking self-gratification makes us unhappy people. It really does. It makes us miserable. It literally does because you never gain the ultimate pleasure. Remember the word ultimate pleasure. It never gets there. What does it do? It robs us of our, of our peace and usefulness as a servant for Christ. All this begins with where? Within begins within. The problem is not everything else. The problem is you. The problem isn't that you were born in the wrong family. The problem begins with you. Once you understand where the problem starts with, then you can begin to work with, you know, God. Okay? Going back to John chapter 8, verse 32. What did John 8, 32 says? Anybody? What does it say? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Make you free. Make you free. The truth shall make you free. So it's within. He's going to bring out all those things, you know, ugly things. So if we allow pleasure to rule us, we hamper and we stump our spiritual growth. Okay? We don't have growth anymore. In fact, we begin to regress. We regress. If it gains dominance in our soul, we have, and spiritual defeat is at hand. It's always going to be at hand. We're always wondering why we're defeated. We're always wondering why we're discouraged. We're always wondering why it leads to depression. 
it leads to depression. Understand that. You know, we call it bipolar now, but before it used to be called manic depression. Why is manic depression coming in? It's because we're trying to seek the pleasure of the flesh. Okay? Uh, that's why people get married and divorced. Marry and divorce is because they're seeking that pleasure of the flesh. Okay? And so it robs you of your peace. It robs you of your peace. The source is not, you know, people when well, you know, we can blame other people. Is this person, is that person, is my boss, is this, and so we'll change jobs, we'll say change churches, uh, we'll change marriages, anything, you know, so that we can have that pleasure. And we need to understand that some believers let their pleasures influence them by allowing pleasure to become their primary source to life. And that's a very big problem when it becomes your source of life, you know, pleasure. Okay. We find that uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, it talks about the fact that our sanctification all, you know, um, hinges on the fact that we sustain uh, from sexual immorality. We, you know, we stay away from our passion of lust. And it's more, goes much deeper than just sexual uh, gratification, but also our passion for lust, lust after anything. And so we want uh, to be vessels in sanctification and honor. And how do we do that? We seek more of God. When believers give themselves over to such pleasures, what happens is they lose their spiritual freedom. Okay? I hear this all the time. People come to church and say, I'm just not free anymore. <laughs> well, again, what does the scripture say? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. The reason why you're not free is because you're not allowing the, the workings of the Holy Ghost to begin to get rid of those things that are binding you. Paul says, let's set aside every weight that besets us, that weighs us down, that we can't run, we can't freely worship, we can't freely praise God. We can't even go through a trial and tribulation freely. Okay? And we should be able to go through that freely. You say, well, if, you know, I don't really feel that. Well, Peter says that there's joy in trials and tribulation. Why is that? Because you know that God is about ready to do something great in your life. You almost welcome him to a certain point because he's going to do something great. If you get through this, you're going to come up as what? As Job said, you're going to come out as gold. Okay, so... Uh, they think that they gain freedom, but they lose freedom because they become slaves to sin. They, oh, you know, like I hear this all the time, well, we're free. We're free from, you know, the, the legalism of the word. You know, and we need to understand that um, they're not really free. They're actually they're binding themselves to more things. And so their pleasure is their master. It begins to become their driving force. They cannot get enough. And, and I'm sure that you know people like this. They just can't get enough of it. You know? And so they enter a desperate search for happiness through pleasure. Um, we find that Jude 1, 16 through 19 talks about the fact that who are the, you know, notice these pleasure seekers. What are they? They're grumblers, they're complainers. <laughs> Again, they're grumblers and they're complainers. Uh, they, they, their mouth is full of great swelling words. They're flattering people to gain advantage. You know, they'll say one thing just to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who walk, would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensuous per persons who can 
who caused the vision not having the spirit. So they don't have the spirit of Christ. Hedeism is the philosophy of Playboy magazine. Okay, that's the Playboy magazine, that's Hedeism. Um, the philosophy that ple pleasure is the chief end of man, and I'm not even going to begin to talk about this philosopher here, but um, he, this philosopher said uh, one time of the Koreans, formalized the philosophy of Hedeism and taught that we are to avoid pain and seek pleasure as a way of life. Pentecostalism is not pleasure oriented. okay? It's not pleasure oriented. People think that all we do when we come to church, when we worship God, is all about the outward, you know, worship. That's not a, what it's about, okay? It's not about feeling good. It's not about feeling happy, okay? God doesn't care about your happiness. What does he care about? He cares about your joy, because he is joy, okay? It's not your happiness he's concerned about. And so it's not pleasure. It's God oriented. It's all about God. As we go back to Mark chapter 12, it doesn't say anywhere that we are to seek God, you know, put God first. We are to seek Him with all our heart, our soul, our mind. And He will give what? The desires of our heart, which is more of Him. Okay? So that's what we're looking for. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy life. Set, uh, being satisfied in Him. Okay? Being satisfied in Him. You know, He's my all. And I'm going to end with this scripture. It says, in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, you shall show me the path of life, the path of life. You shall show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And on your right hand is what? Pleasures forevermore. Where do you, would you rather be? Seeking your own pleasures or seeking the pleasures of God? So James now turns from the internal personal conflict to the subject of putting self above others in 4, 11, and 12. And we'll pick that up next week. I ran out of time. The clock is running out on me. And so I apologize, but I just feel that this is very, very important that we understand that our pleasures are not of the things of this world. It's not about pleasing ourselves, but it is about pleasing God. The more we please God, the more we will have pleasures of what? Life. God will give us. You know, people say, I wish I could find a good man, or I wish I could find a good woman. Well, first find God. Mm -hmm. And he will give you that, you know, perfect mate. I wish I could find the perfect job. Well, first put, you know, seek God. Seek God with all your heart. And then he will lead you to the right job. And you want to know something? Because he knows you. He knows what you like and what you dislike. He knows what you're capable of doing. Some people love digging ditches. Some people don't. Seriously. Some people like being outside and digging ditches and they don't have a problem with that. It's physical labor. Some people don't want to do physical labor. You know? God knows you. He knows your talents and he knows your, your gifts. And so, you know, if we put him in our lives, we begin to seek him with make him our all in all, then we'll find pleasure within him. This all stand. We'll pick it up again next week to finish up this first section.